Hi, my name is Christopher Naranjo, and I'm here to walk you through the reference material I have for my user story. My user story, as you see, is to enable new project proposal submissions, and it's described as a staff or faculty member I'd like to be able to submit and edit a proposal, check the status of it, and receive notifications about it. When developing this story, I needed to think about exactly what my acceptance criteria would be and what are some outlying cases that I would need to account for such as staff and faculty must not be able to submit an incomplete proposal they must be able to delete their proposals and they must be able to receive notifications be it through their website or through email now as you can see, if you've noticed, you may have seen that task number 697, email web notification for proposal status, is currently in dev. The reason for this is because we are unable to obtain a domain for our email server, so for now the feature currently doesn't exist, but web notifications work. On login. Now let's take a look at my use case diagram. So for faculty and staff, they first are going to be able to view the web page, and this web page I'm referring to is the project management screen if you have watched my other video. Now from that screen you can either submit a proposal or view it. Now, if you're going to view your proposal, first, it's going to have to query the database. It's going to have to find the proposals that are attached to your account. And when you're at the view proposal screen, you're going to have the option to edit those proposals. And as you can see there, when you edit a pro proposal, you're going to have another two methods, one delete proposal and another one edit proposal information. Both of these query a database and do self-explanatory actions, be it deleting the proposal or updating the information in the database. So now if we go into this with a bit more detail, we can look at the uh, sequence diagram, which is a bit high level. So as a faculty and staff user, you first are going to view your project proposal page, which automatically is going to query the database. So we start with display my proposal, which automatically happens when you log in. It's going to uh, query the repository or database for all the projects associated with your email. It's going to return a list of all those projects, and then it's going to populate the page with said projects. Now here, you're going to have a couple of choices with all these projects on your screen. You can create a new one, and if you do so, it's pretty self-explanatory. You can, the proposals page will submit your new information to the database. The database will return success or fail if it was correctly formatted. And the proposals page will then update with the new information. Much the same for editing. You click on to edit a particular proposal, and it's going to query for the exact details of that proposal that are allowed to be changed. Now, what are the details that are allowed to be changed? It's things such as the project name, the amount of students you want to work on the project, the majors your project is related to. The things you can't change are your username associated with the project, your email associated with the project. That's not covered within the scope of my user story. So once you have all those details, you edit them. You edit them on your on a very small form, and then you submit them. And it goes basically through the same process as creating a new proposal. It submits that new information to the database, and the database will return a success or a reject message if it was accepted or not. And then the page will refresh with some new data. Deleting proposal, much the same. It was kind of built off the edit proposal path in that it queries for all the details first, and then it will go through and delete all those records one by one. And 
will return success if it was able to delete it and refresh the page which should now have that project removed so now let's dig a bit deeper and get into the class diagram the ones we are going to mainly be interested in are the projects page project edit page project create page so as you can see the biggest feature here would be that the projects page uses a UI bootstrap and basically I'm using that for the animations you saw on the screen like how I have an accordion table you click on it, it expands to show you all the details of the project and my notifications are done through UI bootstraps alert function and every other function all the ng functions you see on those three pages are all supported with base angular now regardless of what you do on those pages they all all are going to pass through our ui router which is going to deliver the controllers for my story to those pages which and uh, controllers are project controller project edit controller and uh, global is projects controller which basically wraps the other two controllers together as you can see, they both are pretty similar. The edit controller probably could have been rolled into the projects controller, but I found it a bit easier to keep them separate for now, because in the future, I would may want to have a bit more uh, authentication control on editing or maybe even creating a project than there exists right now. So with those controllers, they need some way to pass the information they collect to the back end in our database, which is handled by the project service. All it basically does is submit HTTP requests to the back end, and I use simple simplify functions. We create, delete, get, update, and all all being it just does a simple get request and gets all the information from the server related to that email. And finally, the project service relies on my database schema, which as you can see here, it shows all the data I am storing related to your project. Your project name, the um, comments related to this project, which is proj body, uh, username, email, the majors, that are related to your project, which is this uh, amount of students you want, the amount of the maximum amount of students you will need, and the current approval status. Additionally, the uh, project schema has a rather rudimentary API associated with it to handle the HTTP requests passed to it by uh, the project service. You simply say find find by ID, which ID is um, your email address essentially is how I'm tracking all these projects and remove which deletes a project. So now let's go dig into the code exactly. So when you go to the project management page it's going to deliver you my projects.html file and as you can see it's very simple. Um, I creating my class, I'm populating with all the projects related to your email, and creating a, a simple accordion table, which is UI Bootstrap, the uh, accordion table. And you may have noticed that I have a commented out uh, class at the top called BS Less. Early on in development, we had a CSS style that was not cooperating with the features that I would have liked to implement and in the past to get around this issue I created my own I guess you could say class that wraps uh, Twitter's bootstrap CSS so it enabled me to use UI bootstrap with are relatively incompatible CSS. Now, later on the line, we we as a team agreed that 
the features provided by Bootstrap far outweighed the features in our custom CSS, so we ditched most of those most of those original features and um, created and just went to Bootstrap natively. But I left that in there for now. So basically when you click on any project, it's gonna expand and give you all the information related to that project. And next, let's go look at, say if you click on the project create button. Once you click on the project create button, you are going to be delivered the project creation page. And this is extremely similar to the project edit page. So in lieu of showing you both, you're just gonna see the project create page. Um, as you can see, very simple, very simple uh, Angular form. It uh, requires your information, your project name, your username, email, amount of students you want, the maximum amount of students you'll take, and all the majors you are going to be recruiting for this project. And additionally, once you click the Save button, it calls my Save Project function, which we will see in a moment. So now let's take a look at my project controller page. And as you can see here, we have one controller. At the top is his projects controller. And um, down below, we have project edit controller. Now you may have noticed I do have a rather large array of all the majors offered at our school. In my implementation, I found it much easier to just directly declare this array in our JavaScript files than it was to uh, put this into the database and query for all of this information. It uh, made my um, computations and running time a lot faster just to deliver it to the user all at once when they reach this page. So once we um, so when you're do an action on the page, you're going to end up calling one of these functions. When you first navigate to the project management screen, you're going to be calling the all function, which simply gets all the data related to your project, all your projects related to your username, which is your email, essentially. Um, you delete a project, you call the delete prod function. It passes in this I, uh, backend ID I use, which is not visible to the user to delete that particular project and then returns the new list of projects which now it doesn't contain the deleted project. Save project, pretty straightforward, save the project. This is only used by the create project function. Add more majors as you see there. To add multiple majors using my single drop down I needed to add a uh, a workaround as there was a couple issues. So basically I have a selection array which is initiated to blank or an empty list essentially and every time you click add more majors it pushes your current selection in that drop down and increases the size of the selection array by one. It keeps doing that for how many majors you want. Now, additionally, there was a another problem with this implementation, since it was kind of clunky. I needed a way to then copy this information that is now in the selection array to the JSON file that is going to be sent to my server, or, or rather the, uh, the JSON file that will be formed into the put requests that will then get sent to the server and pushed onto the database, which is where the test say function comes. All it pretty much does is just copy your selection array into the correct location in the JSON array. And the edit controller pretty much does the same thing. It's a bit of a uh, better function in a sense that um, it doesn't quite rely on uh, the clunky double clicking to save 
where it should where it will update automatically when you're selecting a, a new major and removing a major from your from your project will uh doesn't matter where within the array it's just gonna remove that and decrement the array and essentially create a new one behind the scenes. So now that we've looked at my project controller, we are going to take a look at my project services JavaScript file, which handles all the HTTP requests between my front end, the controllers and the HTML pages, and my back end schema and API. You can see it uh the all function will get all pending projects and it will get all uh, current projects regardless of its approval status. The uh, create function, project factory create, will put a post request to the server and create the project. Uh, keep in mind all of these uh, function arguments you see here, project data, ID, they're all in a JSON, which becomes extremely handy when we get to the backend, as we'll see in a moment. But well, once again, it's pretty straightforward. Each one does its own particular request. Create does post. Delete does delete request. Get does get. Update does put. And they all go to their appropriate backend routes. Um, I would like to improve this in the future in the sense that if you navigate to these routes directly from uh, VIP dev the website it will actually return you the uh, JSON output. I've noticed on other sites that have implemented Angular that if you try to jump to a backend API route like these are uh, the server will deliver you a 404 page. Um, I would have liked to implement that. I couldn't figure out how to do it in my, in my time but for more time I would love to implement that feature just to protect information that people shouldn't see all right now we are in my back end mind the uh, pun um, as you can see it um, handles all of the routes coming from my project services file and each one will then query the database through various uh, mongoose functions. The ones I mainly use were find, find by ID, delete, and update. And create, or save, rather. So, like on this one, it creates a new project. It's telling uh, my API router that when a post request is received at this particular URL to uh, run this function which creates a new project now i mentioned a short time ago that all my uh, information being passed is in a json and it becomes very very useful here in the sense that now i can just access it like a class and pull out the specific information that i need like here i'm receiving my um, new project data in the uh, rec argument and I just do rec.body dot each field that I've passed, and then I pass that into my new project. I generate a backend ID. This is the ID that I'm using to delete a project and update projects. Again, I would like a way to hide this a bit better from uh, users, but not enough time to invent that. And then I simply just save the function with. Uh, Mongoose, which then interacts with MongoDB and the little database stuff. If MongoDB feeds back an error, I will tell you that the project generally, if I'm getting a error code 11,000, that project already exists, I'm going to return a false on a success and I'm going to prompt you and tell you that, hey, this project name already exists, you're going to have duplicate project names. And additionally, if we get a if the kind field in the JSON object that uh, MongoDB is returning, then I know that you did not correctly fill out this form. That is 
there is a blank field. And you're going to see when I show you my project schema that pretty much all my fields are required information for the VIP projects. Now, assuming all that error checking goes through, I'm going to simply return true, and I'm going to pass a message to the console saying that project creation was successful. This get method just simply gets all the projects right now. Um, for now, it's not really used anymore. I basically use it for uh, debugging. Because as you can see here later on is that I'm I am fine searching to get all the projects pending. I am getting all the projects that are uh, pending for everyone. Uh, I'm getting all the projects for a specific user here. Now these three routes here are very similar, but um. I always requested for other developers user stories that they required these, so pretty simple enough to create them. I told them these are the API routes they needed to send a GET request to, and everything else will be handled by my API. Same thing here, it's going to return all the approved projects for that email, but these are the two big ones that I use a lot. Um, this put request here will edit the project. Um, as you can see, I could probably have gotten rid of this uh, user argument here um, since I am tracking by ID, but simply out of habit, I uh, decided to keep it in there for now. This, it uh, checks to see when you update a project that what exactly are you updating. So. If the JSON object that's being passed in is, say, online 167, if uh, proj if it doesn't exist, it's not gonna, it's not gonna show that portion of the uh, if statement, and it's not gonna update, or rather, potentially update that field with nothing. So I do that for every, I iterate, I, I do that for every field, as you can see, and then I save the new information in the database. Here I just get all the projects by, uh, or rather, I get that particular project, I get the particular project's information, rather. Um, this interacts with the uh, project edit function. This is really the only time you're going to want to look at a specific project, which is either when you're editing it or you're viewing its information. And um, we view all the approved projects. This is a bit uh, depreciated now. I mean, in the future, I probably would want to explicitly separate which projects are approved and which projects are pending, probably on different HTML pages or move them around into two different accordion tables, have one table solely be uh, approved projects, have another table solely be pending projects. And then finally, the delete function, which deletes that project. Well, it will delete the project with whatever ID is passed. If it doesn't exist, it's not going to do anything. It's going to return an error, but it's not going to prompt the uh, user for anything. It's not going to let them know there was an error. Because in the sense, if you're trying to delete something that doesn't exist, I, I'm going to make you think it deleted something. And finally, my project schema, which basically just declares how my information in the database is stored, or not rather, your information, not mine. Um, it simply declares the uh, data types of all these fields. It's mainly strings. Um, if we were dealing with something more uh, robust, or I was dealing with large amounts of data, I would try to optimize this a bit better. Just went pretty simple strings, uh, numbers where I needed it, and a Boolean for approval status. And um, this, which is the major, is it's the array of JSON objects. And finally, the ID. Now, if you notice that all of these fields are required true and 
my conversations with the product owner, he let me know that there should never be a project that has these uh, fields not filled out. I mean, they can't approve a project that doesn't have a project name that uh, doesn't belong to a user or doesn't have the um, correct amount of students or else doesn't have a reasonable amount of students being requested or like has a uh, absurdly large amount of students being requested. And then additionally, whenever a project is created in the database, it will automatically generate a ID, which I'm using short ID for. It creates a uh, URL safe ID. Um, feel free to Google it. The uh, documentation is uh, pretty thorough. It's a pretty nifty piece of code, how that works. And um, finally, I also require that to be uh, true. Um, reading the documentation about short ID, it seems to be very rare. It can't guarantee uniqueness, but it uses seven alphanumeric characters and the uh, chances of that happening is very 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 rare so I don't think it should ever happen but if it does you're gonna get a failure on something that is entirely out of your control but it's simply just submit it again and it should and it will just give you a new another new ID and hopefully it's not a duplicate this time And that about covers it for my look at the documentation, the code, and all the reference material I have in my user story. Thank you very much for your time.